It's 2018. I'm in New York City. Midway through an eight-week off-Broadway season of my show, Randy Writes a Novel. The soon-to-be-pirated YouTube sensation. <laughs> weeks in New York should be a dream, right? Pinnacle of my goddamn career. But I feel like I'm doing the wrong show in the wrong theatre and every night I grab my audience by the scruff of the neck and drag them unwillingly through my own existential nightmare. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever met anyone from New York City, but they don't tend to patiently endure the bullshit of others. <laughs> I once had a homeless man in New York tell me to hurry the fuck up while I was handing him a dollar bill. <laughs> so it's not going great. For added context, the show isn't the only horse meat currently feeding my black dog. Before I came out here, I split with my management company. I have no work lined up after this season. And last week, my girlfriend flew out here from Australia to break up with me in person. <laughs> Yeah, I would have been fine with a phone call, but apparently it's much easier to kick a man while he's down if you're in the same fucking room. So, <laughs> she made the trick! <laughs> this morning, I met a friend for brunch at a cafe in Greenwich Village that only serves oatmeal. The cafe is called Oatmeals. <laughs> it's very good. My friend is also an Australian comedian performing here in New York City and she's had her fair share of depressing career moments. So I was hoping for a little bit of sad sack solidarity. Unfortunately for me, Hannah Gadsby is having the breakout season of her career. <laughs> Her show, Nanette, is selling out every night at the Soho Playhouse. Her audience is filled with celebrities and Netflix have just handed her a gift voucher for a lifetime's worth of cunnilingus. <laughs> I, on the other hand, had 32 people in my Sunday matinee today and 21 of them walked out during the show. 21! Not all at once, either. Just a few at a time, in a steady, humiliating trickle, like people having their number called out in a fucking deli. <laughs> it was the nonchalant disrespect that really broke me. About halfway through the show, an elderly woman in the front row started clipping her fingernails. <laughs> we could all hear it! She did both hands, thumbs inclusive, then slowly got up, put her coat on and left. <laughs> she clipped her fingernails and then left. Do you understand what that means? <laughs> My show was less important to this woman than the speed at which her fingernails were growing. <laughs> 10 fingernail clippings out of 10 is easily the worst review I've ever had. <laughs> After the show, my theatre staff told me that she said she left because she thought there was too much swearing in the show. I mean, to be fair, I did call her a cunt. But... <laughs> the show, I step out of the theatre, turn right and walk 23 minutes down West 42nd Street to Grand Central Station. I purchase a ticket for the first train going north, which is a Hudson Line train to Poughkeepsie for those playing at home. I board the train, remove my jacket, take my seat and vow to never, ever, ever do comedy ever again. Opening song, that's what this is. You thought it was a comedy, now it's a musical. What the fuck is this? I was over there, now I'm right here. I've changed my clothes to signify that it's a different year. Cause this show happens over multiple timelines. Timelines. Like a Tarantino film without the graphic homicides. <laughs> And far fewer foot fetish moments. <laughs> Except for this one. <laughs> Check them out, boys. Opening song, written by me. A singing, dancing piece of shit that you all paid to see. You got it wrong, it's cabaret. Sucked in bad if you thought this would make a good 
first date. <laughs> Cause this show is my goddamn magnum opus. Opus. You made the choice to be here, so you better fucking focus. <laughs> and if you'd rather be at home with married at first sight, you get the hell out. There'll be no refunds. Turns and conditions. Come on! When purchasing a ticket, always review the event and seat selection. No exchange or refund for misplaced tickets or show content objections. Subject to no conditions, consumer provisions, price including taxes. No bad attack at the back and out, you're on crack if you drastically underestimate the power of the written code of practice. As a purple Gen X cis man with an income and a platform, statistically I'm more likely to instigate a shitstorm. But I'm also much more likely to escape without reproach. The system is still stacked my way, that's why I think I can get away with an opening song. Opening song, that's what this is. Has a key change that's a little hit or miss. Opening song, right in your face. I couldn't give a flying fuck about my own fan base. I just wanted to sing an opening song. Fuck you. Thank you. Please take photographs. Thank you. Thank you so much. My comedy actually works best in photographs. Check it out. <laughs> I could be saying anything. You're all a bunch of fuckheads. <laughs> I'm going to burn this shithole to the ground and move to the Gold Coast. <laughs> Never judge a comedian by their photograph, my friends. Unless they're doing this on a billboard. Mm, 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 mm. Judge the fuck out of them if they're making those particular creative decisions. But if you want realistic shots of a comedy show, you have to take photos of the audience. That's what I'd prefer to see, to be honest. When I'm home after a gig, doom scrolling in the pitch darkness. Just shots of my audience just doing this. <laughs> isn't the Queen's Gambit. Ah! <laughs> oh, you sound like a good crowd. You sound like a real good crowd tonight. Very excited about this. Look at you all, you bloody champions coming out, wearing your masks. Good on you. <laughs> bloody love it. Mm -hmm. Actually, just out of interest, Sid Noon, um, give me a shout if you've never seen me in real life before. Make some noise. Fascinating. <laughs> Laboratory tests have shown <laughs> that humans, when meeting another human for the first time, automatically encode three key nuggets of information. Age, race, gender. So... <laughs> what the fuck's going on here? This shit, newcomers. <laughs> I think the fourth nugget of information we encode is what is wrong with you? You know, like it goes like age, race, gender. What happened to your face? <laughs> and sometimes people make it too easy for you to judge them. People with Southern Cross tattoos, or <laughs> people who vape, or <laughs> people who wear shorts, no socks, sunglasses, and a puffer jacket. You're either hot or you're cold, mate. You can't have both. <laughs> Always wandering around judging people all of the time. I don't give money to homeless people because they spend it on drugs, she said, washing a Xanax down with a coffee on her way to a Botox appointment. <laughs> it's a tricky time, my friends. It's a real tricky time. Tricky, tricky, judgy time. Living in a real tricky, judgy time right now. Right now, Sydney, tricky judge of town. What is it? It's fucking tricky. Oh, tricky judge of town right there, tricky. It's tricky time. Oh, I'm living in a tricky town. Right now, hmm, hmm, right now, it's a tricky town. Oh, Lord, it's tricky, tricky town. Oh, living in a tricky, tricky town right now. Good Lord, yeah. Oh, tricky, tricky time. <laughs> Hello there, what's your name? Am 
I looking right down the fucking aisle? I am. Uh, <laughs> fuck! Fuck! Jesus Christ. Bullshit. Hello there. You... Have, the, have the house lights just come on? That's fucking great. Trev's just turned the house lights on, mate. That's going to make a difference. <laughs> That's awesome. I'll oh, just turn those on. He'll see them then, won't he? <laughs> For my text, Trev, what a champion. Give it up for Zach on the sound. Yes. Okay, let's try take two on that. Hello there, what's your name? Zane. What? Zane. Zane with the Z. Yep. Hello, Zane. How are you, matey? Yeah, I'm alright. What did you do today, Zane? Not much. Not much. Give me something to fucking work with, Zane. <laughs> Anything at all, my friend. You catch a bus, you put your pants on, help me out, brother! <laughs> what happened? Caught the train here. You what? Caught the train here. You caught the train here. See, there's something to work with. Zane's now given me a comedic premise. <laughs> I can talk about trains, I can talk about the fact that he's got nothing else to do other than catch a train. <laughs> we can deconstruct Zane's sad little life. Let's go back to Zane. Zaney! <laughs> So where did you catch the train from, Zane? Where do you live, champ? Um, Cronulla. Cronulla! Yeah. Someone went, eh. <laughs> that was the best. I believe that is the international sound for Cronulla. Eh. <laughs> Fucking me. Eh. 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 You, that's how you call out each other in a crowd. Eh. Eh. You're a champ. Hey, Zane, unrelated question. Roll with me on this. Just go with me. Bit of improv. How old do you think I am, Zane? How old do you reckon I am? Man? Just have a little guess. How old do you think little <laughs> me think Randy is? How old, Zane? Yeah, 20. 20? Oh, my God. Thank you. <laughs> Double it. I'm 40, Zane. 40 years of age. It's a good age, 40. I love it. 40's the new 36. <laughs> Unless, of course, like me, you're single with no children, no mortgage and no responsibilities whatsoever. Then 40's the new 27. <laughs> Casual sex and psychedelics are wasted on the young. <laughs> She reminds me, um, this is a good segue, I've, I'm trying to tap into the youths, um, so I've started my own podcast, finally, putting out a podcast. People have been asking for ages, Randy, when are you doing a poot coup? So I'm doing one. Um, I was going to do one of those ones where comedians talk to other comedians about comedy, but I thought, you know what, that's almost too original. So what I'm doing now is a, a bit of a self-help kind of podcast. Do you all want to hear a sample? Yes. It's called The 40-Year-Old Fuckboy. Fuck boy. Fuck you. Fuck boy. Welcome back to the 40-year-old fuckboy. Is it a midlife crisis or a second satin return? Who knows? <laughs> Today on the show, I'm going to be teaching you all how to overcompensate for that pesky childhood trauma by telling a woman you love her on a first date. <laughs> but first, let's open Randy's fuckboy mailbag. Randy's fuckboy mailbag. For people who used to write letters. <laughs> Today's letter comes to us from Trent, from Glebe. Trent writes, I'm a 40-year-old rock-climbing yoga instructor with a top knot who always wears loose trousers to really accentuate my dick flopping around. <laughs> Until recently, my speciality was luring 36-year-old women from my yoga classes to join me for private tantra workshops, but now I can't stop masturbating to trans porn. <laughs> Should I get a Kelpie? <laughs> well, uh... Sounds like you really miss your mum, Trent. Um, you should definitely get a Kelpie. Sheepdogs fucking thrive in the inner city. Coming up after the break on The 40-Year-Old Fuckboy, we're going to be talking to Joe Rogan about the relationship between psychedelic enlightenment and kicking cunts in the head. 40-Year-Old Fuckboy Is it a midlife crisis or a second sadly 
Get it wherever you get your podcasts. Now, I know what you're thinking, Sydney. You're thinking, Randy, you're a 40-year-old, single, moderately successful comedian with ants in his car. <laughs> Seriously, I have ants in my car. <laughs> I don't know what to do about it. They form like their own society in the air vents. As a vegan, I feel bad killing them, but... What kind of man has ants in his car? <laughs> Randy, tell us! What series of fucked up, unfortunate events led for you to turn out like this? Please, skip over any major trauma and give us a light-hearted look into your undoubtedly sordid backstory. Well, I tell you what, Zane, if nothing else, that sounds like a great way to kill 47 minutes of this fucking show. So here, <laughs> for the first time in Sydney town, I'm gonna take you all back to where it all began. Backstory. I was born on the day Lindy Chamberlain's baby was eaten by a dingo. <laughs> Twas August, in the year of our Lord 1980. God Save the Queen was still Australia's national anthem. We were nine years away from joining the global internet and me too was a phrase most often used in response to the statement, I think women belong in the kitchen. <laughs> My earliest childhood memories are a colourful montage of drunk adults eating corn on the cob while staring into the middle distance. <laughs> the sound of cockatoos ricocheting off red brick houses. The innocence of youth shrouded in thick clouds of second-hand cigarette smoke. <laughs> at the tender age of five, I arrived at St Mary's Catholic Primary School, where I met my new best friend, Jesus Christ! <laughs> if you're unfamiliar familiar with his work, he pissed off the wrong people in Israel a couple of thousand years ago, so now we have Christmas and hell. <laughs> which, uh, which, depending on your family, can be the same thing, am I right? <laughs> I'm doing relatable material to find common ground with my audience. <laughs> At age seven, I made my first Holy Communion, where I ate of the body of my new best friend, Jesus Christ, who I'd been reliably informed was brutally murdered because I had been naughty before I was born. <laughs> you see, only the Catholics laugh at that. Everyone else is like, that can't be right. It is! <laughs> That's how they get you! <laughs> Immediately following my first Holy Communion, I had my first menthol cigarette. Mmm, menthol cigarettes. There's a burning tube of toothpaste in my lungs and everyone's invited. <laughs> Catholicism taught me the difference between right and wrong and left no doubt in my mind that right was boring and wrong was fucking hilarious. <laughs> my proudest childhood achievement is the fact that I was the first kid in the 100-year history of St Mary's Catholic Primary School to receive an after-school detention. Literally moments after after-school detentions were first introduced. <laughs> the vice principal, Mr Burke, he pulled all of the students together for this very stern lecture about discipline and the fact that these after-school detentions would act as a deterrent for disrespectful behaviour. And at the end of his very stern lecture, in the silence that followed, I gave him a slow clap. <laughs> And he gave me a detention. <laughs> and once I realised that the dopamine hit attached to being a smart ass far outweighed any of the repercussions... <laughs> there was no turning back. OK, Grade 1s. Bit of shush, please. Our next oral presentation is from Randy Feldface who will be reading his oral presentation on this year's Bicentennial of Australia. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you.
thank you. It's great to be here, Grade Ones. Um, how about a hand for everybody's favourite nun, Sister Dimpna? Um, uh, uh, Sister Dimpna's uniform is looking a little scruffy today. I guess it's just one of her bad habits. <laughs> okay. Um, apparently, Sister Dimpner walks 20 miles before school every morning. I guess that's why they call her a Roman Catholic. <laughs> I've got lots of these grade ones. Please get on board. <laughs> this year is 1988, which is the bicentenary of Australia. Knock, knock. Yeah. Colin. Colin. Colonisation. <laughs> Only joking, colonisers don't knock before they come in. <laughs> Aboriginal people had lived in Australia for thousands of years before it was discovered by Portuguese sailors in the 1500s. Then it was discovered by Dutch explorers in the 1600s then it was discovered by Captain Cook in 1770. I don't know how a place can be discovered if there are already people living there, but I still use Velcro shoelaces, so what would I know? <laughs> Which reminds me, what is Australian history's most famous ship? Censorship! <laughs> pew, 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 pew. Cutting edge material for the late 80s. Pew, 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 pew. Oh, pew, 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 pew. On the 26th of January, 1788, Captain Arthur Phillip hosted the first ever barbecue for him and his crew and the 850 criminals he brought with him. We don't celebrate it as a national holiday yet, but those colourful criminals with their rich tapestry of fantastic backstories would go on to be the founders of a surprisingly boring society. <laughs> Which reminds me, why did the insomniac get sent to the Australian penal colony? Why? They were resisting arrest. <laughs> ah, insomnia. Re I'm only seven, Jesus. <laughs> now it is 200 years later. There are 16 million people living in Australia. Bob Hawke is our Prime Minister, and you can buy a three bedroom house in Sydney for $90,000. Yeah, just let that sink in for a second. <laughs> to celebrate the bicentennial, Brisbane is hosting Expo 88 which will no doubt be the most interesting thing to happen in Brisbane for the next 200 years. <laughs> in summary, sovereignty was never ceded, but sausages are on special. Thank you. I'll see you all at the monkey bars after the show. <laughs> If you are a parent of young children, chances are you have already done or said the thing that will be the direct cause of your child's worst adult moment. <laughs> and the best part is they won't even realise it's your fault. <laughs> but you'll know. <laughs> you'll be sitting there at the back of the courtroom just shamefully watching the cross-examination. So tell us again in your own words, Zane. You took a shit. <laughs> you took a shit in a mailbox and then punched a police horse. And your mum's at the back of the courtroom going, "Oh my god, it's because of that time I put curdled milk into his Fruit Loops and still made him eat them." <laughs> it all makes sense now. <laughs> Difficult being a parent. Don't envy that job. Do not envy it at all. You know. I mean, I grew up in a very loving home. Very loving parents. Never wanted for anything. Happy pants, hyper-coloured t-shirts, Ninja Turtles, Michael Bolton, etc. And, and yet it's very easy to blame your parents for your own dysfunction. Particularly if they're boomers. Oh my God! What's to be done with the boomers? Too many opinions, not enough computer literacy. They're all getting radicalised by Facebook. No more screen time for the boomers! Internet's a scary place for the best of us. They're all running around in their sensible polo shirts trying to figure it out. Get them out of there! 
I mean, I find it challenging. I'm sure we all do, you know? You wake up first thing in the morning and someone's like, oh, hey, what's your fully formed opinion on this incredibly complex social issue that you just learned about five minutes ago? <laughs> Quick, type it into your phone so the rest of us can tell you to fuck off and die. <laughs> The confidence of people on the internet is truly astonishing. <laughs> Imagine the self-belief it takes to tell someone you've never met before that you hope they get fucked by a chainsaw. <laughs> I mean, what a consequence-free life you must have led up until that point. The kid that jumped off the roof onto the trampoline and didn't break their arm. Oh my God, you're invincible. I bet one day you could be the Attorney General. <laughs> point where I oh, get fucked Sydney oh, I'm outraged at that asset why would she lie get fucked we have to never forget that knowledge travels faster than the speed of self-righteousness like your opinions are kind of worthless if they're unbendable over time you know You've got to be willing to change your opinions, learn new information, adapt, fucking keep step with the knowledge. You have to be more like the algorithms that absorb all of your online activity to the point where you just have to think about buying a yoga mat and one smashes through your kitchen window. <laughs> and if you're unhappy, you know, just fucking change. <laughs> if you have the means to change. If you don't have the means to change, that's a terrible situation. I feel awful for you, but you probably do. <laughs> I mean, if you're here, you know, can afford to come and see this shit, <laughs> you could probably change. Might be the hardest thing you've ever done. Might take ages, but please, for the love of God, if you're unhappy, fucking change. Because quite frankly, you being miserable is ruining it for the rest of us. <laughs> Yelling at me in traffic because you married an asshole, just end your marriage. You're killing the fucking vibe out here. <laughs> Geez, I can't wait till we retire so we can hate each other in a camper van instead. <laughs> I've always wanted to yell at you in a camper van. Ugh. Traveling only broadens your horizons if you're open to having your horizons broadened. Otherwise, you're just the same dickhead in a different deck chair. <laughs> It's astonishing how quickly the intensity and density of New York City melts away behind me as the train winds its way along the bank of the Hudson River. Urban grey makes way for forest green, and as the train pulls in at Cold Spring Station, I feel myself starting to wake up for the first time in months. Have you ever washed clothes at the same time as a duvet cover? And then when you take the duvet cover out of the washing machine, all the clothes are somehow inside the duvet <laughs> cover. And you have to climb in the duvet cover, get all wet from the duvet cover, just to rescue your little ball of clothes from the bottom corner of the duvet. <laughs> The last few months, I feel like I've been stuck inside a duvet cover in a washing machine. And as we pull in at Cold Spring Station, it feels like someone's reached in and yanked me out of the bottom corner of the duvet. <laughs> I wander up the quaint little main street of Cold Spring, and my brain is having trouble processing the fact that I was in a cultural melting pot of eight million people an hour and a half ago, and now I appear to have stepped onto the set of an episode of Whitey McWhiteson Goes to Whiteopia. <laughs> but I catch myself being elitist, and I hate being elitist, so I stop and I say hello to a man who's walking his dog, and he hears my Australian accent and starts telling me that this is the town that Don McLean lived in when he wrote the song American Pie. Realising that I was right to be elitist, I wish the man a speedy death and continue up the hill. <laughs> D 
Did you hear that? Was that back there? What was that? Back to the story. I find a hotel, eat a bowl of soup, and fall into a deep sleep. In my dream, I'm eight years old, lying in bed in the spare room at my grandparents' house, listening to pigeons cooing on the windowsill, waiting for everybody else to wake up. My grandmother leans in through the doorway. Good morning, chum. Hi, nanny. Penny for your thoughts? Oh, I could have done better, you know? I've had everything handed to me and I haven't done anything with it. Well, you can either lie there carrying on like a two-bob watch, or you can pull up your britches and get out of your own way. Thanks, Nanny. Right, up your pop. I'll make you some yeast on toast. <laughs> Yum! <laughs> it's still dark when I wake up in cold spring and it takes me a good seven minutes to locate the switch for the bedside lamp. I'm constantly baffled by lamp manufacturers who think it's terribly clever to conceal the most important feature of a fucking lamp. <laughs> Without a switch, it's just a shit sculpture. <laughs> I feel like I'm always rifling around up the skirt of some lamp or another. Lost track of the number of times I've had to send my hand on a deadly spelunking mission <laughs> down the back of a motel room bed to trace my way along the lamp cord. <laughs> Dodging tumbleweeds of pubic hair and <laughs> navigating a minefield of discarded prophylactics. <laughs> Only to find out later you're supposed to knock three times, turn in a circle and provide a stool sample before it turns on. <laughs> Sick of lamps! <laughs> that is the message of this show. <laughs> no more lamps! Oh my god, I'm the missing link. Super spreader. <coughs> <coughs> Run! Run! <sighs> I get dressed and I step out into the crisp dawn just as the sky is starting to yellow out in the east. Cool, clean air fills my lungs. And this scene would be picture perfect if I could just get Don McLean's fucking American pie out of my head. <laughs> A leisurely 15 minute stroll later, and I'm at the entrance to the Hudson Highlands Nature Reserve. I rest my face against the mossy bark of an enormous oak tree, take a moment to synchronize myself with my surroundings. I inhale, step into the forest, and plan never to return. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I realise, based on the stunning silence that occurred during that blackout, that it's a bit stupid having flashbacks from 2018 when you clearly know what happens at the end. <laughs> like, oh my god, what's gonna happen? He's gonna do a show in Sydney in two years. Surprise! <laughs> Fucking spoiler alert! <laughs> Clearly, I changed my mind about quitting comedy at some point. And that's all right. It's good. <laughs> it's good to change your mind. I do it all the time. Constantly changing my mind. Changing my opinions. Gotta do it. Gotta change those opinions. Old Randy, fucking changey pants over there. Always changing his fucking mind, isn't he? Hmm? When was the last time you changed your mind? <laughs> Sometimes you've just got to try new things. See what happens. For example, I've never done this at this point in the show before. <laughs> Gotta try new things. <laughs> Gotta change your opinions. 
Well, give us an example, Randy. Who said that? <laughs> uh, all right, I'll give you a fucking example, Sydney. Um, <laughs> drugs. <laughs> drugs. I don't do drugs. My privileged opinion of drug use is that productivity is more important than escapism. And also, I'm wired in such a way that if I even so much as look at a drug, I will be doing speed off a strip club toilet seat within two to three hours. <laughs> so my opinion is, I should not do drugs. But then I went to Canada. <laughs> Anytime you walk down the street in any Canadian city, you're constantly getting crop dusted with clouds of delicious smelling marijuana smoke because weed is legal there. So people walk around punching blunts like they're at a fucking folk festival. <laughs> I was in Quebec City for two days and I started following pot smokers down the street like a cartoon character floating towards a pie on a windowsill. <laughs> <laughs> So I changed my opinion and decided I should do drugs. <laughs> Has anybody here actually been to Quebec City? Anyone? It's a beautiful part of the world, isn't it? Bit confusing. French speaking Canadians ruled by the Queen of England. Pick a fucking lane, Quebec. <laughs> But I was doing shows there and I was like, I'm not going to seek drugs out, but if somebody offers me drugs, I'll definitely take them. And. <laughs> Ah, uh, sure enough, after a show one night, I was approached by some youths. Some youths approached me and they offered me a brownie. Now, they're very fond of edible drugs in that part of the world. The pot brownie and the hash cookie and the weed cake and the wacky tobacco toasted sangy. And <laughs> these youths offered me a brownie the size of a fucking John Grisham novel. So I said, yes. <laughs> And I took it back to my hotel room and I put on some comfortable trousers, put a bit of King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard on Spotify. <laughs> and I haven't done drugs for about nine years at this point, so I didn't want to go too hard. So I just broke off a tiny corner of this massive brownie and just had a little <laughs> Just a little shnum 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 Tiny little <laughs> Because I didn't want to go too hard. But then, after like 10 minutes, nothing happened. So I ate the whole thing <laughs> really fast. Like there were cops at the door. I was like, huh? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and um, then I Googled how long it normally takes for a pot brownie to kick in. <laughs> to share with the class how long it normally takes for a pop brownie to kick in. Does anybody know? About an hour. Yeah, about an hour. I was like, oh, I'm going to die in this hotel room. <laughs> I started getting my affairs in order, cancelled my subscriptions to Yoga Glow and Chatterbait, started putting a PowerPoint presentation together for my own funeral service. And then, after like 75 minutes, I realised it was just a fucking brownie. <laughs> like just a regular old drug-free chocolate brownie, lovingly prepared by the youths of Canada, just to be fucking innocently distributed amongst the tourists. So now, my opinion is... Canadians are fucking idiots. <laughs> Me again. <laughs> Hello. <clears throat> Am I your favourite part of the show so far? Yeah. I'm very cute, aren't I? <laughs> I'm also massively racist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, babies, without exception, prefer faces of their own race. It's just how we come out. It's all like that. And if you're sitting there going, my baby's not racist, I'm talking specifically to you and your goddamn racist baby. <laughs> I suppose up until this point in my life, no one's really given me an alternative to that perspective. Um, you know, everybody from the church to hey, hey, it's Saturday pretty much reinforces the idea 
that different means worse. Which is probably why I'm also quite homophobic, I think. <laughs> that one's a real bummer, because um, I'm actually attracted to some of the boys in my class. <laughs> I've even fooled around with a couple of them. But it's pretty clear that sort of thing is frowned upon. And I'm also attracted to a couple of the girls, so I think I'm just going to put all of my eggs in that basket for now. <laughs> Save myself from the inevitable ridicule, you know. <sighs> I'm still just a little sponge, you know, sponge, 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 just taking everything in, spongity, spongity, sponge, forming my little opinions, oh, spongity, 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 sponge. <laughs> you know, people say all sorts of things around me, and while I don't expect to be protected from reality, sometimes it'd be good to get an explanation to go along with what I'm witnessing. Words have an impact, you know. And a single word can have a vastly different impact depending on which side of the fence it lands. The word freedom is often used to imprison. The word settlement might mean birthright to an Israeli and unlawful military occupation to a Palestinian. The word gluten might mean limited menu choices for a handful of people and hilarity for the rest of us. <laughs> I suppose I'll either settle for these inherited belief systems when I'm older or actually do a bit of compassionate investigation and consider the alternatives. I don't know. Who knows? You know? It's a, it's a lot to think about, really. It's probably a bit much, to, to be honest. Is that a racist baby? <laughs> The timing of that was exquisite. <laughs> it's hard being little, isn't it, baby? You know, it's tricky, it's hard. It's a lot of choices to make and it's a lot of pressure, you know? Spongity sponge, you know? <laughs> I mean, I want to be successful when I grow up. I want to make my parents proud, you know? I want to be happy. I want to be a good person. I want, I want like a, a good job. I want a house, a wife, kids. These are things that I'm told make a successful grown-up. I don't want to be one of those adults that has ants in their car. <laughs> I wander directionless through the trees for a few hours, thinking about what it means to belong to a place. This forest is foreign to me, but I feel at home here somehow. I actually feel more at home when I'm not at home, which either pr proves that home is a state of mind, or maybe that I don't really feel like myself where I come from. I don't know if that's true, actually. I mean, I grew up in country Victoria, but you wouldn't know it, really. I, I don't know what my relationship to country is, you know. I mean, occasionally I give people directions using compass points, <laughs> if that counts. I hate it when people in the country do that. Right, oh, no, matey, what you want to do, you just want to head east for about 20 clicks and then take a south to south westerly bearing. All right, Galileo. <laughs> Just give me some landmarks and some street names. I'm not taking the King's Road into battle. I'm trying to get to best and less, you dickhead. <laughs> you know, I think, I think Australia is an incredible country, but the overall feel of the place often elicits the same response in me as that seven-year-old boy slow clapping his way into a detention. <laughs> you know, I just, I just want to shake it up a bit. We paint ourselves as lovable larrikins, but we're extremely fucking uptight. I think we repress or 
reject a lot of the interesting parts of this place. The edge, the friction, the variety, you know? the truths that we're constantly protecting ourselves from. That lucky country bullshit that's built on the misfortune of others. I mean, look at who's running the country. It's pretty gross. <laughs> the entitlement's pretty disgusting. And that's not a political statement, that's just like human observation. <laughs> Yucky poos, you know what I mean? Look, if you don't need to consider any life experience other than what's happening on your own little quarter acre block, or if you can see a doctor, whenever you need to see a doctor. And no part of your brain is reserved for processing if you're in danger or even where you actually fit in a culturally complex system. I don't necessarily begrudge you any of that, but I don't want to hear your opinion on immigration policy. Like, you don't get a seat at the table if you're ambivalent about babies in detention, but have time to openly weep while watching the MasterChef finale. <laughs> I stopped to relieve myself against a small stone wall in the undergrowth and discovered that I'm actually standing on the edge of a swimming pool. It's the ruins of a swimming pool. It's full of leaves and fallen branches and shit, but it's unmistakable in its aquatic origins. I look around and slowly it dawns on me that I am standing in the middle of the abandoned ruins of the Cornish estate. Edward Joel Cornish was born in Iowa in 1862. He was practicing law by the age of 21, climbed his way up to assistant district attorney and became the personal lawyer and friend of a man by the name of Levi Carter of the Carter Lead Company. Carter's Lead Works was like the largest manufacturer of paint in the United States. We're talking a good 60 years before people recognise that lead poisoning from paint and airborne particles from leaded petrol causes learning difficulties, aggressive behaviour and a tendency to believe whatever you read on the Facebook. <laughs> When Levi Carter died in 1903, Edward Cornish became the president of the company and married Levi's widow, Selena. As they say in the lead business, you can't cut a dead man's lunch. <laughs> Edward so... <laughs> I'm keeping that fucking line, I don't care what you think. <laughs> Edward sold the company to National Lead. He bought a giant chunk of stocks and he ended up serving as president of National Lead for like 17 years. And in that time, he and Selena left the city and they purchased this grand estate in the Hudson Hills. They bought it from a Chicago diamond merchant named Sigmund Stern. And I fucking wish I made that detail up because Sigmund Stern, the diamond merchant, sounds like a character from a Scooby-Doo episode. <laughs> Sigmund Stern and somebody's have been stealing all of my diamonds. <laughs> that bit was just for the racist baby. <laughs> Edward and Selena were madly in love. They threw lavish parties in their expansive mansion and they rolled through the roaring 20s in lead-funded style. Then one day in 1938, at the impressive age of 76, Edward Cornish dropped dead at his desk from a heart attack. Over the following two weeks, Selena took care of the arrangements. She made sure Edward had a proper send-off and then she died herself. The mansion and the grounds were passed on to Edward's nephew, Joel, who spent the next 20 years largely ignoring his aunt and uncle's prized legacy until accidentally setting fire to the mansion in 1958 and burning it to the ground. And here I am, 60 years later to the day, standing in the ruins of Edward and Selena's dream home, the charred remains of a shared life. All that was once important to these people, reclaimed by the forest. Good. <laughs> Fuck them! <laughs> Who cares? These are the kind of stories that we give weight and value to. This is the measure of success that we're fed. Every history book in the world tells a version of this fucking fairy tale, but who gives a shit? 
<laughs> it's easy to lose perspective when you're swaddled in safe narratives. I bought it. Like, I'm achieving a lifelong dream right now, performing my own comedy show off-Broadway in New York, and it is the worst thing that's happening to me right now. I could not be taking it any more personally. The fucking entitlement of that. That is privilege. Privilege is not an abundance of opportunity, it's an absence of obstacles, right? And the best I can hope for, if I use that privilege for all it's worth, is that one day my legacy will lay in ruins in a forest somewhere and some kid will stumble upon it while pissing on the ashes. <laughs> And standing there, I burst into hysterical laughter and I turn around and I start running, crashing my way through the forest back towards the train station, plotting my revenge on the theatre-going crowds of New York City. <laughs> <laughs> the season was just as shit. <laughs> it didn't get any better, they fucking hated me. But my attitude slowly improved, right? And I came back to Australia and I made myself a promise that if I ever got an opportunity like that again, I would get out of my own way. And I didn't have to wait long because 2019 was arguably the best year of my career. I was the most fun, I was the most present, I had a fucking great time. And it started with a magical telephone call. Stand by for a chilling reenactment. <clears throat> bring, bring. Uh, bring it to fuck it to bring it to bring. Hello? Hey, Randy, it's Hollywood. Oh my God, Hollywood's on the phone. Hi, Hollywood. Hey, Randy, we love what you do. You are funny, and believe us, we know funny. But tell me, Randy, why have you never done a reality television program? Ah! Oh, come on, Randy. Reality television's not the shame factory it once was. And what is reality if not a commodity? And what is entertainment if not a competition? You listen to me, Hollywood. I am not a shill to be bought and sold like a common Pop-Tart. I say good day to you, Hollywood. We will pay you a wage, cover your airfare, and guarantee you a one-year working visa. Shut up and kiss me, Hollywood. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> That's exactly how it happened. <laughs> that, my friends, is how I signed on to be a contestant on NBC's feel-good hit of the summer, Bring the Funny, a reality television program in which comedians were competing for 250,000 US dollars. Spoiler alert! <laughs> I did not win. <laughs> I did have a really nice time, though. I met some wonderful people, I told a few jokes, and I made it out of there with my anal virginity largely intact. <laughs> the, only time, the only time it got a little bit intense was while we were filming the reality portion of the show. Now, they call the interviews with contestants on these reality shows reality. That's what they call the reality bit, right? All the, all the reality shows have them. You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, and then I thought, well, this souffle is never going to rise. I just want to make my kids proud. Kelly is such a slut! All that, right? <laughs> they shoot it, they edit it, and they turn the contestants into characters. So you at home can invest in the character and give a shit whether or not they win or lose. Now, everybody on the show gets assigned a story producer. The story producer's job is to make the contestant look interesting, like they've got a compelling backstory. And my story producer fucking hated me. <laughs> because you've seen my backstory, it's not good television, you know? There's no drama. And she snapped, three weeks in, she just snapped. After me giving her smart-ass responses to every delving question, she just went, ah! Randy, where is the heart? Where is the drama? Where is the hook? And I said, there isn't any. I tell jokes for a living and I sleep like a fucking baby. <laughs> and she snapped in front of the entire crew and grabbed me by the arm and dragged me off set. And everybody went, ooh. <laughs> She pulled me out onto the back lot. We were shooting at Universal Studios in Burbank, in, in California, and she shoved me into a golf buggy, because they all drive around in these little golf carts. She got in and started driving, and I was like, um, where are we going? And she said, shut the fuck up! <laughs> and I went, oh, I'm being fired. <laughs> and this 
icy feeling just settled in my stomach and I started sweating and I started shaking and I was like, oh fuck, I blew it. I just smart assed my way out of another opportunity. I got here, this is it, they're gonna kick me off the lot. I'm never gonna work in America again. I'm never gonna do, I'm gonna, my name's gonna be dragged through the mud. This is gonna, oh my God, look, there's the Jaws ride. <laughs> We went through three security checkpoints and then one massive security checkpoint and we drove out into this giant courtyard surrounded on all four sides with huge concrete walls with murals of movie stars painted on all the walls. Ingrid Bergman, Marceline Dave, Audrey Hepburn and Val Kilmer for some reason. <laughs> In the middle of the courtyard there was an enormous swimming pool, a bar with a bartender and she looked at me and said, get the fuck out. So I got out and she just drove off. So I started walking towards this swimming pool where in the middle of the pool there was a huge, fat, bald man with sunglasses floating on an inflatable pink flamingo. And as I got to the edge of the pool, he lowered his sunglasses and said, I hear you're having trouble finding a backstory, young man. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, I don't really have any drama to draw from. And he said, well, you are contractually obligated to find some drama, young man, so hop to it. He nodded to the bartender. The bartender pressed a button on the bar and suddenly Two doors opened, one at either end of the courtyard, and out of one of them burst Jason Statham, wielding an axe, naked, covered in baby oil. He just looked at me and said, do whatever it fucking takes. Ah! And I went, ah! and I started running towards the other door, and he was gaining on me, and the man in the pool said, don't come back without a little drama. And I leapt through the door, and it slammed shut behind me, and the axe went, into the door and then I was plunged into pitch darkness and I crawled on my hands and knees for what felt like an eternity through spiders and mud and rats and shit until finally I emerged from underneath the Hollywood sign blinking in the blazing Californian sun and I started to panic I was like oh my god I need a backstory I don't have a backstory my parents are still alive I was never molested I don't support the troops what am I gonna do <laughs> and then I noticed that there was like a 5g mobile telephone tower and I read somewhere that they like kill bees or something so I was like oh maybe that will give me radiation poisoning that's a good angle so I started rubbing myself against this tower <laughs> and while I was rubbing myself against the tower I woke up a homeless man who was sleeping at the foot of the tower and I was like huh he's bound to have a communicable disease right so I started sucking his dick right? <laughs> so while I was bobbing away gah, 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 on this homeless man's rancid cock gah, 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 he started to tell me a story <laughs> He said, you know, <clears throat> I was on season two of America's Got Talent. What they don't tell you when you leave is that you're too famous to go back to your job, but not famous enough to be actually famous, so no one will hire you. Faster, mm. you think you're gonna be the person on reality television that everybody loves, but that's not why we watch. We watch for the failures. We look for the flaws. Deciding winners based on a public voting system has given these morons the illusion of power. They don't know how to handle that power, so they take to Twitter and they say awful things and they ruin the hopes and dreams of people more talented than they will ever be. And I said, You're right, old man. I don't need to change my image to suit the unrealistic expectations of some imaginary audience. I can make it in Hollywood on my own terms. So I turned around and I ran all the way back to the studio and I got there just as they called my name to go out on stage and I went out there and I smashed it. Three and a half minutes of bulletproof comedy gold and the crowd went wild and then I realised I was still in my hotel room and there was definitely weed in that brownie. <laughs>
closing song That's what this is Start edging towards the exit If you're busting for a piss Closing song Hold your applause my contract is in violation of child labour laws. I think I've learned a valuable life lesson. Really? Yep. When you've got it good, you've got to count your fucking blessings. And when you've got it bad, you can just blame your childhood. Nice. Blame your parents, blame religion, blame, blame the, the fact, fact that, that you're misunderstood. In a closing song. Closing song. Closing song. In a closing song. A closing song. Good night, Australia.